uh, the pharmacist that was instrumental in uh, drafting the NIOSH hazardous drug alert. So clearly USP is working on incorporating elements of the high-risk drug alert actually into the USP standards. Just some, some general observations. I think USP 797 actually moves our practice closer to industry standards, good manufacturing um, practice standards. And there's certainly some good intentions behind USP 797, but I still see a lot of confusion out in, in practice about what we're actually supposed to do with this. Um, I have an opportunity, I just finished a three-year um, assignment with ASHP on the on, Commission on Credentialing, uh, which is the body that's charged with residency accreditation. So through that I've had a chance to go out and do 10 or 12 surveys a year, talking to technicians and pharmacists in different parts of the country, and I get the privilege of reading about 300 written reports a year. And so I get a pretty good flavor of what, what's happening out in practice. And you know, there is still a tremendous amount of, of questions out there about how we're actually supposed to implement these things and, and comply. And the other difficult thing is, as I mentioned, there's been two revisions in, in two and a half years. So it's actually a moving target. You know, just when you think you've got it nailed down, something changes. And the, and the difficult thing for us in healthcare is, you know, most of us don't have unlimited dollars. So if you want to go get construction dollars to upgrade your facilities, you're probably only going to get one shot at that. And, and to upgrade your IV facilities and then have to come back the next year and say, oh, but they changed the regs, now I have to do it again, it's pretty difficult for us. When you look at the other thing that I hear out there a lot is, well, why are we doing this? This seems like a lot of work. Um, but when you actually look at what's happening out in practice, I mean, we've seen a large number uh, of pretty high profile uh, errors that have occurred and have actually caused patient harm, including death. Um, resulting from microbial contamination of solutions. And we've actually seen an equal number of errors uh, that have happened from, from large content errors. And, and there was just an FDA uh, letter issued uh, fairly recently against a major commercial manufacturing facility of, of IV solutions for contamination of their products. So it is out there and we definitely do have room for improvement. <coughs> the, uh, the NIOSH uh, high risk drug alert actually came out uh, pretty close to the same time that USP 797 was released. Uh, the original version was available on the web in March of 2004 and then the hard copy was published in September of 2004. And this really kind of suggests a, a whole new standard of practice for how we should be handling hazardous drugs. But unlike USP 797, which actually can carry force of law, the NIOSH high risk drug alert is really guidelines only. Um, however, it might form the basis for future regulatory action by uh, the sister agency, which we're probably all more familiar with, and that's OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. For those of you that aren't familiar with NIOSH, and usually most people in oncology are, but outside of oncology, a lot of people have never heard of it. It's actually the, uh, the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. And it's the, the government agency that's actually charged with doing research and then making policy suggestions um, about ways to prevent workplace injury and illness. And it actually is part of the, uh, the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, which ultimately rolls up into Health and Human Services. We're probably all more familiar with its sister agency, OSHA. Um, both of them were created at the same time in 1970 um, as part of the Occupational Safety and Health Act. Uh, but unlike NIOSH, which is part of Health and Human Services, OSHA is actually part of the United States Department of Labor. And OSHA is actually responsible for creating workplace standards and then enforcing them. So OSHA actually does have inspectors that will come out and you, know, you could see them in the workplace. And the way that the, uh, the two agencies generally interact is NIOSH does the research and makes a suggestion. OSHA looks at the suggestions and then creates workplace standards and enforces them. So the high-risk drug alert has the potential for actually being incorporated into OSHA standards, which would then mandate compliance. The uh, intent of the alert is really to, to educate all of us as healthcare practitioners about the dangers of working with hazardous medications. Um, it's intended to apply to all workers in healthcare settings, so pharmacists, technicians, nurses, um, everybody in a healthcare setting that comes into contact with hazardous medications. Um, it's not intended to apply to industry, however. And it, it kind of uh, uses a universal precautions approach um, to handling hazardous drugs. Within the, uh, the alert, it actually defines what they consider hazardous drugs. And uh, anti-neoplastics obviously are, are featured very prominently in the report. That's kind of the, the focus of the report. But in addition, they also describe some antivirals, hormones, some of the, the new biotech drugs, and some miscellaneous agents as hazardous. 
And uh, the charge back to us is that within each of our organizations, it's up to us to really compile that list of what we consider hazardous medications within our own organizations. I mentioned that uh, the focus of the NIOSH alert is clearly um, on operator safety, um, whereas USP is actually on patient safety. And I think um, it, it, it really, uh, there's still a lot of confusion out there with this as well. You know, when I talk to a lot of, of pharmacists and technicians, you know, they're really not sure, you know, are we going to implement this, are we going to do just part of it? Uh, because it, it constitutes guidelines only, there really is no compelling legal or regulatory requirement to implement uh, the, uh, the NIOSH suggestions in the workplace. So there's still a lot of questions out there about, well, should we be doing this or shouldn't we be doing this? Is it really the standard of practice yet? When you look at the two documents kind of side by side and you overlay them, it's interesting. I mean, there's, there's far more similarities between USP 797 and the NIOSH alert than there are dissimilarities. Um, the major focus is they just come at the topics from a different perspective. As I mentioned, USP comes at it from the perspective of patient safety. NIOSH comes at the topics from the perspective of healthcare worker operator safety. Um, but unfortunately, although these things were released at the same time, there was very little, if any, communication between the two groups while these two documents were, were actually being prepared. So there are areas uh, where they're in conflict. And unfortunately, when they hit the workplace at the same time, we were left to try and figure out how to harmonize these two documents and how to resolve those conflicts. Um, USP, as I mentioned, though, has recognized that, and the working group has been actively attempting to incorporate and address those areas of discrepancies, so we get a little bit clearer direction on what we're actually supposed to do with these documents. <clears throat> One of the first big questions that I see out in practice is, you know, where are these supposed to be applied? And NIOSH is pretty clear. It's uh, suggested for all areas that handle hazardous drugs. USP 797, on the other hand, is intended only for those areas where compounded sterile products are actually prepared, stored, and dispensed. And in the current uh, revisions, they actually changed the word dispensed to transported. So now it says prepared, stored, and transported. But the key word in that sequence is actually stored. Um, there is uh, an immediate use exemption. So, for instance, many of us have oncology satellites or dispensing satellites where the compounded sterile products that we prepare are for immediate use. So in my own facility in the infusion center, you know, we get the, uh, the orders from the patient, we double check and we make sure everything is correct, we get their labs, and if that's all right, then we mix their chemotherapy up right on the spot and it gets infused. We don't store anything. So under the original iteration of USP 797, that facility was exempt from those standards because everything we did was for immediate use. However, in the uh, current published revisions, um, USP has reversed that position and they've adopted the NIOSH uh, uh, actually guidelines and they've said that now all hazardous drug preparations have to meet USP 797 standards. There is no more um, immediate use exemption. Um, and you can see the, uh, the quote there, because of known safety risks of hazardous drugs uh, to healthcare workers and other non-patients who may be exposed to them, hazardous drugs such as cancer chemotherapy drugs shall not be prepared as immediate use compounded sterile products. And this is pretty consistent with what they've been doing in, in Europe for years. Uh, so we need to pay close attention to that because that's definitely going to change our practice patterns if that's adopted. And uh, the current revisions are available for public comment uh, for about another 60 days. And then at that point, USP will take them back and decide whether they become permanent. Facilities is another big question that we get out there. You know, a lot of people are trying to decide, well, should we upgrade our facilities? Or if you're building a new facility, you know, what should we actually build uh, to be in compliant, compliance? And, in the first iteration of USP 797, they mandated uh, that, that we move to the ISO standards. And that's the International Standards Organization for Air Quality. And under our, our old system, we used to use the old uh, Class 100, Class 1000, Class 10,000 clean room standards, which basically just looked at particle count. But the ISO standards not only look at particle count, they also look at air exchanges per hour, they look at pressure, they look at temperature, they look at humidity. So there's a, a lot more that we have to comply with for our clean room standards now under USP 797. And originally, uh, they mandated ISO 8 quality air in the anteroom as well as in the clean room. The first